Welcome everybody to today's combustion webinar. It's the last one for uh, this season and then we'll take a short break and resume in the fall. Uh, we have the privilege today to welcome Professor Mastarakos of Cambridge University or University of Cambridge. Um, his research is well known to us all in the combustion community. It spans computational fluid <laughs> dynamics, turbulent flames, experimentation, modeling, pretty much the whole range. Combustion is um, certainly his thing. So uh, I'm very looking forward to his talk. Today he's going to tell us about the stabilization of flames, whether they in, be in uh, bluff bodies or swirl induced recirculation and um, experimental and LES results of some of his recent research on the topic. Um, before we get started, I'll just say if if we could, um, anybody who has questions can put them in the chat uh, window at the bottom of the screen and I will read them off at the end of the uh, lecture and that way we'll uh, have time to, to go through each one of the questions hopefully one by one and uh, yeah with that the floor is yours Nandos, tell us about turbulent combustion. <laughs> thank you very much Isaac and thank you uh, Wenting and uh, Yidran for the, the opportunity to participate in this series of webinars that have been fantastic and you have kept the community together. Um, Flame Stabilization Revisited, the title alludes to a problem that has been well studied in the past and we're just putting some final uh, touches onto it, if you like. Uh, but there are some novel results that I wanted to share with you. The work is uh, based on the thesis and the postdoc work of a few people uh, so I want to do uh, just a tiny bit on uh, a recap on the textbook stuff on stabilization and the lean blowout, and a little bit then on our older and more recent experimental work and modeling work. And as I will be presenting, I will be throwing some comments about what uh, remains to be done, which is a lot. So if you uh, look at, say, uh, any combustion textbook, here I lifted this uh, uh, picture from Glassman's book. The canonical problem of flame stabilization is always there. And the idea is that if you have a bluff body or swirl induced, you have a recirculation. And if you ignite a flame there, there is an anchoring point, And then there is a flame growing at the shear layer. If this is a long flame relative to its width, is what you would encounter in an afterburner, which might be one of the earliest problems studied. If it is a short flame relative to its width, is what you would see in the inside of a gas turbine combustor or maybe an industrial furnace. And uh, the afterburners tend to be with V gutters, so bluff bodies. Inside the uh, com gas turbine combustor, you would have to have stabilization by swirl. But the main idea is that what you're recirculating here is hot products. And the velocity and the equivalence ratio of your gases, or if you like the global equivalence ratio, if it's a non premix system, like the ring quench lean type of combustion concept, the weak extinction limit would tend to follow a curve such as this. We have uh, worked a lot, not only on the LBO limit, the limb blow off limit, but also the ignition limit and I will not discuss that today. However, capabil lack of capability to ignite is not completely different than the blow off. So studying these limiting phenomena, you learn a lot about practical stabilization, but also about um, fundamentals. So a recap of the basics, I'm a bit embarrassed to say these things in front of Ed and uh, Yiguan and lots of other people in the audience, but just in case we have uh, PhD students there who have not heard these in the past, I just want to point their attention to please study the fundamentals from uh, CK Law's book or Glassman's book or lots of other books, because a lot of what we do later in turbulent combustion in the experiment or in DNS really has to hook up to the basics. So a self-sustaining chemical reaction, of course, occurs when the temperature is high. As soon as you lower the temperature because of dilution by water or because of heat loss or because of aerodynamic strain that causes stretch or because of curvature or because of radiation or even because of flame, flame touching. And I would like to emphasize that because it is a recurrent theme in what we will see later. The flame can extinguish. Turbulence affects all of these at different rates. 
the local strain affects the stretch, it uses curvature, it can make one flamelet touch the other, and there are many different ways that turbulence will affect the approach to extinction. Stabilization of a flame is a word that is used also, for example, for Benson flame stabilization. Uh, it's not always the same thing as extinction. And uh, the local extinction, the degree of local extinction, how it manifests itself to a global de destabilization phenomenon or global extinction, if you like, is not necessarily the same in all flames. Very often we'll see in papers the phrase the flame extinguishes because the strain rate is too high. This is probably true. However, there are caveats. And I think in recent research, this is what has been emphasized. For example, the flame has to be aligned with the strain rate. It is the stretch rate that matters and not their dynamic strain on its own, etc. So the piece of advice I have for the PhD student out there is please think carefully before you use this phrase. You really have to know what you're talking about. One of the old afterburner research problems, it was one of the first problems ever studied. If you have fuel and air at velocity u, maybe there is turbulence characterized by a u prime in the length scale. There is a V gutter here of width d. There is a wake and you could have a flame and the flame is characterized by lemon of burning speed. The turbulence later is not necessarily equal to the turbulence in the vicinity of the V gutter, depending on the proximity of other gutters or also the shape of the shear layers and the shape of the recirculation zone here. So the turbulent flame speed could be something different than what we would expect based on the incoming turbulence. The stability of this problem has been analyzed with uh, in one of the very first problems, for instance, by Marble and Zukowski, a seminal paper thought about uh, all the way back to the early 50s. The, how long does it take for a mixture to auto-ignite, if you like, in the presence of diffusion of gases from hot mixture? So the idea there was that this recirculation zone, because it recirculates hot products, ignites the incoming reactants. And when this balance ceases, then we lose stability. Alternative views have been put forward by Longwell, Spalding, uh, through the well third reactor concept. Again, there, the residence time through the recirculation zone, if it is too short, I do not allow uh, reaction to complete, so I will lose the flame. All of these ended up with something like this. So you would always compare a global fluid mechanical time, uh, something like width of the gutter divided by the velocity, and the time chemical time scale, which is uh, very often uh, measured by the kinematic viscosity of the laminar flame speed squared. In the, in the very nice review by Tim Lewin and Schanborg and co-workers, various other correlations are proposed. But it's interesting that up to 2009, and this is actually one of the conclusions from our work as well, still you do not have a correlation that works for all flames, for all fuels, and for all geometries. Which canonical laminar flame should we use to understand these problems better? And I think here we have a wide choice and there is, uh, we have to be a little careful. For instance, if you're thinking of premix flames and uh, I ask my student to do a calculation of the extinction strain rate for the premix flame, there is a choice to be made. Should it be the back-to-back -back flame, premix versus premixed, or should it be hot adiabatic products versus premixed? The two have quite different response of heat release rate versus the strain rate. And of course, it depends on the list number. And uh, Professor Law's book is, is, uh, explains that very well and very carefully. And I advise everybody to read those chapters. It is the flame flame touching that is often responsible for losing the flame rather than extinction of the flame because of the strain. If I'm thinking of a non premix system, I have an oxidizer, which could be vitiated there 
would be air plus hot products against the fuel. And if the temperature of my hot products plus air is above some critical value, I may never have extinction. So the S-shaped curve stops being S-shaped and doesn't have a catastrophe point anymore, but it is monotonic. And this is relevant to mild combustion. It might also be relevant to limb blow off if I'm thinking of a recirculation zone containing hot gases. <clears throat> I'm sorry. So again, my advice to the student is uh, be careful which canonical flame you use when you want to compare your turbulent flame. Uh, some of the misconceptions in the literature out there are because we have been comparing against the wrong uh, lamina flame. So let me start with some of our old experiments and move on to the more recent one. I'll be very brief with the older experiments. This is almost 10 years ago, just a bluff body stabilized flame, premixed methane and air, atmospheric conditions, uh, disk stabilization. So this is not a 2D flame, it's a 3D flame. What we are looking at is how the flame shape changes as we change the velocity or the equivalence ratio and we approach blow off. Um, first observation, the flame shape begins to shorten and I begin to have reaction zones in the immediate wake of the bluff body. So I have reaction zones, if you like, inside the circulation zone. And this is the same whether the flame is enclosed or open. We looked at this problem a little bit more carefully. So we went into this flame with OH PLIF, fast PLIF, and with PIV, and we tried to characterize the local Karlovitz number along the flame sheet. So by measuring the velocity, we have the U prime, and if we have the 2D velocity field, we can estimate the length scale. We know the equivalence ratio of the mixture, so we can estimate Karlovitz number and Damkolen number not only based on the global fluid mechanical quantities, but also based on the local turbulence quantities. And an interesting finding was that at the anchoring point, the Karlovitz number was low, but it was increasing as we're going downstream. And this is because, of course, the turbulence is increasing as we go downstream. And this led us to believe that extinction isn't happening here at the anchoring point, but it's happening later. And this, of course, has an implication for gas turbine combustors. It means that the extinction of a flame and the destabilization of a flame isn't only a function of what you do at the anchoring point, but it is a function of all the combustor aerodynamics that conspire to change the turbulence level in your combustor. The other thing we saw with the diagnostics is that this is the OH field. You see that uh, the black body is here you see that your flame can be fragmented and in, in the immediate wake of the bluff body, you could see uh, absence of OH. In uh, where were these flames in the diagram, in the uh, usual uh, regime diagram, uh, you begin to approach the, uh, not really in the broken reaction zones, but in the thin reaction zones regime. And this is where uh, extinction happened. In terms of Karlovitz number, the extinction was like 12 to 15. This number is greater than the critical Karlovitz number of about two, which is for spherically expanding flames from Bradley's work and others. And it is much less than the high Karlovitz number research that we have seen in recent years in many labs in the States and elsewhere that uh, when you have lots of pilot gases around your flame, around your mixed mixture, you can reach Karlovitz numbers of even a thousand. And the difference is that the hot gases in when you stabilize a flame are actually produced by the flame itself. It's not the same as in the very high Karlovitz number research we've seen where the Anchoring, the stabilization, is performed by other gases than the flame gases. You have a separate stream of hot gases. And this is what allows the Karlovitz number to go such high. So in problems where you have recirculation zones, probably the Karlovitz number would not exceed 10 or 20. 
we have gone a bit further with the diagnostics. And again, I'm taking back a few years now. Uh, we looked at formaldehyde, and it turns out that as you approach blow off, you build up a lot of formaldehyde in the recirculation zone, even when your flame is still there burning stably. So on the first row of images here, you see instantaneous shots of OH and formaldehyde. Here is one instantaneous. This is another. This is a third. And you see different type of events there. You see broken reaction sheet. You see huge regions of formaldehyde in the uh, wake. You see sometimes very narrow regions of formaldehyde in the wake. And you tend to see narrow regions of formaldehyde in the preheat zone uh, of the flame sheet. And when you take the time average, the picture far from blow off is what you might expect. Your recirculation zone is full of OH, hot products, and your formaldehyde is only in the preheat region. However, when you take the time average close to blow off, you see a lot of formaldehyde. So this is a finding that is important, and uh, it tends to be associated with extinction. When we see extinction, we would see the buildup of formaldehyde. We have recently seen the same thing now, and here I will be reproducing some slides from recent papers in uh, Adelaide. Here we used the evaporizer design from Fortier and Golfopoulos' group, and uh, we scaled it up just a tiny little bit to pre-vaporized kerosene. The idea is that we want to go from methane at one bar to kerosene at or synthetic aviation fuels, if you like, at high pressures. And we want to do this in two different directions. One, the first paper uh, is to use kerosene at high, at low pressure. And then I will show you a slide from some work we did with KAUST on using uh, studying extinction of methane at high pressure. So let me start with the pre-vaporized kerosene. First, we pre-vaporized liquid fuels uh, with carrying air. We have some small uh, atomizers there. And we have a fully pre-mixed, pre-vaporized mixture of kerosene or other liquid fuels and air in the corner of the bluff body. We have used two different uh, kerosenes. Uh, they are denoted as A2 and C1 from the National Jet Fuel Combustion Program. They were, these fuels were kindly shared with us by Med Colquitt and Tim Edwards from the US Air Force. And we're very lucky that uh, we could collaborate with them so that our results would be comparable with other results uh, in Georgia Tech, in Ohio, in other labs with exactly the same fuels. So what do we see? Exactly the same burner, the same student doing the experiment, the same day you do the experiment, you run the burner with methane, and then you run it with pre-vaporized liquid fuels, uh, ethanol, heptane, the A2 kerosene, and the synthetic kerosene. And you see that the equivalence ratio of extinction as a function of the blow-off velocity is different. We would expect to see difference. But the question is, can we correlate that data? And the answer is no. And this is interesting. We thought that this simple problem, we would be able to have a correlation that works for all fuels. And we tried various. We tried the typical strain rate uh, comparison. We tried uh, well-state reactor type of ideas. This is another correlation that has been proposed uh, by Heywood, Abbasinski, Radkishnan. Uh, it's an older one, but it's actually, I like it a lot because it gives a little bit of microstructure in, uh, in how it comes about. It talks about flame propagation across the fine structures in a turbulent eddy, and they end up with something that looks like the other correlations. Uh, again, a dumb column number comparing a fluid mechanical time scale and the chemical time scale. And the D and the methane data is on a different curve than the liquid fuel data. We thought it might have been a Lewis number effect. Uh, we know from Bradley's and the spherically expanding flame, the Lewis number is important. And we looked at the group Karlovitz number times Lewis number that tends to correlate nicely the flame speed of uh, the spherically expanding flame. Again, it didn't work. 
So the question is that we do not have yet a correlation that even for this simplest geometry will work for all fuels. There might be some reasons for that, complete different, very different response of the flame because of their Lewis number to stretch, a different way they respond to curvature, and also might be low temperature kinetic effects. I'll show you in a minute, or maybe I can go back a few slides. And even in the methane case, we see that there is formaldehyde in the recirculation zone. This alludes to the presence of partially quenched products or partially reacted products, reactants, if you like, in the recirculation zone, which means that low temperature chemistry might be important. I don't know if my broadband is uh, enough for you to see the movie. Uh, if you can see the movie the way I can see it on my screen, on the left here, you see chemiluminescence of a blow off event of the pre-vaporized kerosene. And you see how the flame slowly disappears. What you are seeing here lasts only a few milliseconds in real life. On the left, on the right was the OHPLIF as we fully lose the flame and you see that we begin to have uh, our circulation zone being filled with non-OH. We don't know yet exactly what this is, but the recirculation zone gets emptied of hot products and this causes the complete destabilization. What exactly is happening? Uh, again, we don't know because we don't have a multi-scalar system that we can see the exact composition during this transient. But what we think is happening is something similar to what's happening with the methane. So this is the pre-vaporized kerosene. There is flame, flame touching in this region of the flame. And then we have a lot of unburned stuff recirculating in the recirculation zone. And eventually you lose all of the flame. The movie here on the right is five kilohertz fuel PLIF. This is the annular jet containing your reactants. And slowly we begin to fill the whole recirculation zone of unburned stuff. The time all of this takes is not insignificant. And actually there is an interesting difference between the time of the blow-off event for the different fuels. So the methane, if we take the, if we integrate the OH star signal, the cumulescence signal, and we plot it as a function of time, and then we look at the time of complete disappearance and we work our way backwards, we can find the duration of the blow off event. So methane, ethanol, heptane, A2, C1, these are the two kerosenes. They have different uh, durations of the blow off event. And it's a consistent finding that the kerosene has a substantially longer LBO event. Essentially, the, flow, the flame doesn't really want to extinguish. It just hangs around and reignites from little pockets inside the recirculation zone. It might be that this is a manifestation of some low temperature phenomenon. And therefore this might explain why a correlation that is based only on the flame speed, which is a high temperature chemistry phenomenon, doesn't really work for all fuels. There is still uh, work to be done on this one. We don't really understand what's happening and uh, simulations would be very helpful. So the mechanism, at least for the premix flames, is that you have fragmentation of the flame, not in the anchoring region, but downstream where your U prime, your turbulence is more intense and where you have significant flame, flame touching. Once you have lost the flame there, the convective pattern in the recirculation zone brings the unburnt reactants and partially uh, reacted reactants into your recirculation zone, you start losing the fact that the recirculation zone has hot gases, and this destabilizes the flame at the shear layer, and then you have complete extinction where your fuel now enters into the recirculation zone. And all of this process lasts many milliseconds in terms of D thickness, uh, width of the flame holder over U, it's tens of D over U. So it's many residence times. 
I will go very briefly through the high pressure work. This was pre presented by Aaron Skiba uh, in the symposium. We took exactly the same burner and we put it in um, a Kaust uh, uh, lab and we saw something very interesting. The aerodynamics changed completely. And we saw that uh, we thought that we had Reynolds number independent aerodynamics in our burner. And we thought it would be only a Reynolds number effect, but actually it isn't. And we saw that the flame angle at the anchoring point changes. And we saw that the recirculation zone width changes and the flame shape changes a lot. You see, this is the V shape type of flame. EIV looks very different streamlines here compared to the M type of flame, shorter recirculation zone. And the result is a different uh, stability line. The conclusion is that uh, although we thought that it would be a straightforward step to go from one bar to higher pressures, uh, we see even changes in their dynamics. Again, it is all of the burner or dynamics that matter, not just the wake. And this might affect the stability here, it might affect the width of the circulation zone. And of course, what is there in store for us all the way to high pressures and sprays and kerosene or new synthetic fuels? So I think the next generations of PhD students will have a lot of things to study. Let me now go very briefly through some atmospheric pressure experiments, but not with a single flame, but with multiple flames. This is important from a gas turbine perspective when you have annular combustion systems. From an afterburner perspective, if you have many V gutters close by. So in our rig, uh, we call it the annular rig. We have our air and fuel fully premixed mixture in this plenum, and then we split the flow equally into uh, different burners. And each of these burners have a little swirler and a bluff body. And we look down, downstream towards the flames or from the side because the side is quartz. Each individual burner has a swirler and this is the chemiluminescence, the time average chemiluminescence. You see the flame is not uh, fully axisymmetric anymore because of the interaction with the neighbors. And when you have 18 or 12 burners, what this does is changes the distance between the burners. You have uh, different um, uh, interaction regimes. So the shape has changed. The, has the blow off changed? Uh, the answer is yes. I will try to play this. It makes an interesting sound. I don't know if you will hear the sound. It doesn't play very well. And um, when the this is the 18 burner, the burners are close together. Each of them, each of the flames is stabilized on the bluff body, and you see that as they expand, they eventually meet the neighboring flame. In the case of smaller number of burners, this meeting point is later and allows there is a bigger sudden expansion, if you like, between the burners. So you could allow stabilization here. As we go close to blow off, we see interesting things. For instance, I will try to play this. You see occasional detachment of the flame in one burner, but there is still a little bit of uh, combustion going on in the neighboring burner and then the first burner that extinguished could try take gases, hot gases from the neighboring burner and reignite. And this allows for a wider range of stability in the context of how you define it, in the sense of uh, it's, more, it's more blurry, if you like, the boundary between stable and fully extinguished, <clears throat> because we have this range of uh, uh, a wide range of conditions where we may have only a few burners alight that keep igniting the other burners. And this is more pronounced when you have a small distance between your burners, less pronounced when you have a large distance between your burners that begins to look like, 
like the single Berner experiment. <clears throat> so if we try to correlate the blow off of the interacting Berner system, we see that uh, again, even it's the same student that is doing it is the same lab, same air, same fuel, more or less same burner, the single and the multiple, but there is no good correlation. The single burner lean blow off is not the same as the interacting burner in the annular uh, rig, especially when the burners are closely packed. And here the correlation we used is this Damkolen number from uh, Rad Krishnan. Uh, it would be the same with others as well. The message there is that uh, if, if you are a gas turbine engineer and you study only a single flame, that doesn't necessarily mean what will happen at your engine when you have neighboring flames as well. We have also looked at uh, a linear rig uh, so this is five burners in a row. And we looked here also at non-premixed flames. Uh, you cannot see it very well in the photograph, but there is a little hole here in the middle of the bluff body. In this passage here is where the swirling air is coming out. And we have looked at premixed flames uh, and non-premixed flames. This is slide. This is the premixed flame close to lean blow off. Flames are still attached at a few points close to the bluff bodies. The behavior is different in the central burner and the other burners. I think there are similar observations uh, in Georgia Tech, Adam Steinberg's rig made similar uh, conclusions. We looked at the OH star, the chemiluminescence, that tells you something about the location of the reaction zone, but also the formaldehyde. And again, we see that formaldehyde, when you approach blow off, builds up a lot. In this case, it builds a lot in the region between the burners. The non premixed flame is a little bit better understood. Uh, the reaction zone is where it should be. And the formaldehyde, you would tend to see it associated with rich mixture fractions, so close to the inner jet. And close to blow off, though, again, we see a little bit of build up in the outer recirculation zone. Can we correlate? Again, the difference between single burner and multiple burner begins to be important. And uh, again, I do not think we have a single correlation that works for all type of devices. Just very quickly uh, to, with spray burners, I take you a few years back in the same device we used Premix swirl and non premix with central injection of methane and spray. And uh, the data for all of these flames are available for modeling, and many people have used them. The shapes of the flames are, of course, different. The condition of the blow off is, of course, different. And we looked at the duration of the blow off event. This was also interesting. As I said before, the premix flames take a long time to extinguish as you approach the blow-off event. The non-premix flame, more or less similar. The spray flame, in more or less the same aerodynamics, took much shorter time to extinguish. If you like, the duration of the blow-off transient is much shorter in the spray. And we attribute that to a, a double, uh, uh, two things that are going on when you have a spray flame. Not only you lose your flame, your reaction zone itself, but as you get colder, you do not evaporate anymore. So you, it's a double whammy if you like. You, not only you lose your reaction zone, but you starve the burner from fuel because you do not evaporate as much. And this we have also seen in modeling that I will come in a minute. So again, complications, possibility of low temperature uh, chemistries, in order to capture this phenomena properly, you need full LES, turbulent uh, combustion model that is good and good chemistry. And of course, this complexity partly explains why we see great difference in the various industrial uh, devices and the different labs present different uh, uh, LBO conditions because of uh, these complexities. Just uh, to finalize with our experiments, 
Uh, in this paper, you can see different shapes of flames and different degrees of local extinction as measured by the probability of liftoff for different liquid fuels. The atomizer was the same, but of course the atomization is different because the surface tension of all of these fuels is different and the evaporation is different, so the flames are different. So it's interesting to see modeling of these flames. As you approach to extinction, you have a very fragmented and a very convoluted flame sheet. And actually we think that about maybe 60% of the fuel or more is actually escaping and burnt. So for the next uh, five, 10 minutes, and then I will stop, I want to go very briefly through our modeling efforts, especially for non-premixed flames. Uh, if you want, we can discuss this later, but we are using the conditional moment closure model. The conditional moment closure is a model that has been developing over many years, started from Klimenko and Bilger, who put down the equations. You are talking about how reacting scalars, the conditionally average reacting scalars, depend on the conditioning variable, which is the mixture fraction in our case and also in space. So the CMC equation, after a little bit of mild modeling to capture conditional convection and conditional large-scale diffusion, conditional dispersion, if you like, in, uh, due to the large eddies, looks like uh, this. It's a five or the PDE. You have mixture fraction dependence, time, and three spatial coordinates. You have an unsteady term. This term is micromixing, the scalar dissipation and second derivative in mixture fraction space. This is like what you see in the flamelet model plus the chemistry. So the balance, if you solve this equation separately, this is what you would do in the steady flamelet model. If you include the unsteady term in the transient flamelet model, but the CMC model has these extra terms that allow for flame stabilization, heat losses to walls, uh, etc. There is a lot of modeling involved here, especially for the scalar dissipation, but is uh, relatively understood now, especially for, from DNS studies. What is not so well understood is how evaporation appears. So if I generate the mixture fraction as my fuel is evaporating, I have extra terms and these terms have the conditional evaporation rate. We have a, a model for these terms, which is still uh, not fully validated, but um, it seems to work so far. I will not discuss in detail the double conditional moment closure. I just want to show the equation here for those of you who are interested. Uh, you solve with detailed chemistry in the mixture fraction and progress variable, and then you can get your structures, uh, the flame structures from unburned through the stabilization point to the burnt point. And we have employed this model for a few flames. This one is the Rouen spray flame, and we capture uh, relatively well many of the quantities. Back to the single, uh, back to the single conditioning. Uh, CMC. In the past, we used it for stable flames. We have used it for some DAF, and we have used it for the Sydney swirl flames. Conditional average is well captured. Uh, we have also used it for our own uh, non premix flame, where we looked at the condition of lean blow off. And we're happy to report that with a model that has been developed over the years and it had only one or two constants that have been validated against jets. You capture the blow off of a swirling non premix flame from first principles. So here is the air velocity as a function of the fuel velocity at blow off. These are the experimental, sorry, this is the ex, these are the experimental points. When you run the LES at exactly these points, you see a stable flame, but a very bad one. You increase the velocity and then you have complete blow off to within 20, 25% of the uh, air velocity, experimental. These are very expensive calculations, millions of CPU hours, because you have to solve the CMC equation with good resolution. Your LES has to be very good. 
but also your chemistry has to be substantial. We do online solution of the chemistry. Is this the way forward to industry? I don't know. Computers do get faster. Our code is old and probably not very well optimized. Nevertheless, if you can accelerate the turbulent combustion interaction somehow or the chemistry, uh, you need to do it if you are to use this sort of uh, tool for day-to-day -day, uh, use in industry. We have also used our code for the lift off of our spray flame. The spray is injected here at a cone, at an angle. What you see here is the formaldehyde and here's the OH. So the product of those two signals give you the reaction zone and you see that the reaction zone is lifted. So we have validated the LES against the probability density function of the lift off height looks reasonably good. So we believe the code and we believe the model. We are now using it for kerosene uh, and we are happy to collaborate with uh, Professor Wang's group and Fokion Golfopoulos' group. And they were, kindly, they were kind enough to give us their chemical mechanisms for these two kerosenes, the fossil one and the synthetic one. And we have uh, used it for our experiments. Flame shape is captured reasonably well. The flame does break apart as you approach blow off at conditions that are about 15% of the experimental value. It is, of course, a much more sensitive calculation than the gaseous one. The spray CFD is always very sensitive to the spray initial conditions what you do with your atomization. So although you thought you might have it, you change a little bit the angle of your injection of your spray, and then you don't have it anymore. So things are sensitive to the numerical setup. And it's important that because uh, we have to make sure that what we're concluding is robust enough. Uh, my final two slides are borrowed from Sandeep Jela, a colleague from Siemens Energy, who simulated our Cambridge experiment, the linear rig, with a commercial code, a CCM plus, with a thick and flame model. The main reason I'm showing you this is to uh, communicate that industry now is doing serious calculations, and uh, they have the computing power and they have the people. And also the commercial codes now, they, they have detailed chemistries and good turbulent combustion models. So the distance between the lab and industry has shortened, which is good. Uh, Sandeep ran our premix flame with his code. These are five burners. What is imaged here is the temperature. It's instantaneous temperature uh, snapshot when the velocity was 16 meters per second here, and when it was 30 meters per second. And we do see the beginnings of a blow off consistent with experiment. In this uh, graph here, I have the OH PLIF outline that essentially shows the flame sheet far from blow off and close to blow off from our other burner. So it's not exactly this burner, but it is similar that shows that the action zone does go across the circulation zone. So similar to what we have seen in this one and similar to what Sandeep is capturing with his um, model. And uh, we also see in the CFD, the buildup of formaldehyde consistent with experiment. So in order to do that, what you need is to run a lot of chemistry, good aerodynamics with your LES, and a good turbulent combustion model. In this case, it was the thickened flame model. There are things to say there about the thickening factor and this and that. Nevertheless, the large scale features of the phenomenon were captured. Okay. So let me finish. Uh, the background combustion theory on flame stabilization and flame blow off is extensive, a lot on laminar flames, but it pays dividends to look back at the books, at the textbooks, and uh, make sure that what you're seeing in your lab and in your experiment is consistent with the right uh, canonical problem in the textbooks. With the new diagnostics, uh, we can distinguish perhaps now between local extinction and destabilization and global extinction. 
We think every geometry behaves slightly differently. And this is why a single correlation hasn't really worked. And the reason this is so is because what happens in the rest of the burner because of the recirculation is as important as what happens at the anchoring point. And therefore, when you have many burners in the vicinity, you have the possibility of flame flame interactions. And again, this affects the LBO point. In terms of modeling, you definitely need an advanced turbulent reacting flow model to capture this phenomena. Probably tabulation, uh, flamelet tabulation doesn't work. You really need to solve your chemistry online. Evidence from our lab with the CMC model and other labs with other models suggests we're not far from claiming that we can capture the LBO curve of an academic burner, subject, of course, to the usual uh, caveats that you need to carry lots of chemistry, good spray description, and of course, appropriate turbulent combustion representation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be very happy to uh, take any questions. And uh, if uh, anybody wants a copy of these slides, uh, I'd be very happy to share a sanitized version. Okay, thanks so much, uh, Nandis, for the uh, great talk. We've got a number of questions from the audience, so we'll just dive right in um, in the order they're received. Uh, the first is from Jay Gore. It says, should we recognize partial premixing as an original contribution, or should we recognize rich quench lean, low bypass air, lean direct injection, and other phrases to reduce the importance of partial premixing and partially premixed flames in including double and triple flames in the original contribution. So the phraseology, what would you say to that? Um, so if I got the question right, w w whether we want to use the phrase partial premix or whether the blow off of partially premix flames is very different than RQL and uh, sequential combustion. Maybe Jay can, uh, can clarify. Yes, uh, that was uh, that was my question. But I think uh, you addressed the students so very well. Uh, a lot of times, students will uh, raise their hand and ask uh, this question. They would say, "Oh, in this particular paper, I saw rich quench lean," or mm -hmm. in this paper, I saw a different phrase being used. But it looks like the apparatus is very similar to a uh, partially premixed flame apparatus that uh, you covered in the class. Uh, then we yes. go into this explanation, how the concepts are related. Then the conversation comes up, uh, are uh, these uh, defined on the basis of local small volumes within the combustor or are, is this a global concept where a whole combustor is a yes. premixed or partially premixed or uh, rich quench lean or low bypass, uh, uh, you know, there, there are probably, uh, I, I, I recited only maybe four or five names, but people have come up with a dozen names in the yes. community. And I kind of sometimes feel like, uh, uh, I know human beings have a tendency to make original, uh, to be original, to, uh, we were talking about different color clothes and so forth. So, is it just that, or is there something very fundamentally different about all of these different concepts? I think if you look at the canonical, the difference in the strained flames, I mean, Ed is in the audience and I'm sure I will say something wrong here and he could correct me, but if I look at Professor Law's book, there is huge behave, difference in behavior in the counterflow paradigm, whether it is premix, premix, hot products versus gas, or people have also looked at stratification in that paradigm. And the extinction is very different. The extinction conditions are different. So when we try to compare what we see in the real device that has all of these phenomena at different places against a canonical flame, we have to be careful. This was my main point. My second main point is that because of the circulation, the aerodynamics of all the combustor is important. 
So we may lose different parts of the flame. So whether it is we're losing it where we're having the pre-mixing or whether we're losing it where it is fully pre-mixed, it's up to the burner. So we need to be careful. That, that's my main comment. Yes, yes. And uh, that answered my uh, last question I was going to, uh, I was typing in saying, uh, should we emphasize the uh, transient phenomena, not just laminar flamelets, but uh, laminar flames, but in fact, ensure that we utilize the word the transient laminar flamelets? I believe we should. I believe we should, because there is a lot going on in these transients, especially as you're close to the critical points. Thank you so much. Great. The next question is from Iguang. In flame stabilization of turbulent combustion, such as in a recirculation zone, the flame speed may be significantly modified by ignition, i.e. the flame speed is a function of ignition dom cooler number. How do you consider the ignition effect in flame stabilization in engines? Um, when you say engines, I presume you mean gas turbines here? Yes. Because uh, I presume you, I, I guess you, um, you, you allude to the fact that I may have weak reactions going on before my main flame zone, right? So the flame speed changes. Is this yeah. what you're? Yes. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I could have, if my temperature of the reactants is so high that I have low cooking of my fuel before it hits the flame, the flame speed would be different. And I believe that the blow off would be different because of phenomena such as these we've seen, even when the reaction, the reactants are cold, because you have this partially quenched fluid recirculating. So you could have a lot of reignitions going on. Ignition in the sense of autoignition, a chunk of fluid left alone to autoignite. So yes, it could happen, I think. And I believe it. There has been some uh, data from Georgia Tech where they saw with fast chemiluminescence things popping up out of nowhere in their circulation zone. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know there. if we have somebody in the audience from that experiment, yeah. but this was my recollection. Yeah, thank you for the very uh, insightful and uh, clear presentation. So your, your image about this uh, formaldehyde separation with OH is very interesting because uh, the formaldehyde reaction with OH, that is one of the dominant reactions to generate heat release and same time generate radicals as well. So I said this kind of diagnosis to uh, measure two species at the same time is uh, give a clear physics about what is understanding in a uh, ignition and uh, an yes. extinction process. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is actually from myself. Um, in the high pressure test cases that you're talking about on slide 21, I assume that as you go up in pressure, the thermal load of your flame is going to go up. That should affect the heat load on the burner, particularly on the bluff body, but also on the confinement windows and so forth. And so that's going to affect the temperature and of course the quenching of the reaction zones or the recirculation zones there. So how much of the effect does heat transfer uh, play when you go up in, up in pressure? Uh, we have seen that uh, not in the high pressure rig, but in the low pressure, if we change the metal bluff body with a ceramic one, the blow off curve shifts a bit. The key physics of the blow off transient though stays the same and the aerodynamics do not change that much. When we go now to the high pressure, uh, I take your point. I do not know exactly the answer. However, if I remember right from uh, uh, from the experiment, we could see a sort of um, bi-stability in this burner. We could have at the same conditions two different types of flames. So it's probably aerodynamic nature. It's probably not uh, a heat transfer. Also, from my experience with the uh, bluff body flame configuration, it's often open to the atmosphere. When you're running in a high pressure test rig, of course, it's fully enclosed. So does that change your thermoacoustic uh, characteristics significantly? Um, again, I wasn't there at Kaust when they did the experiment, but I remember the guys telling me that they couldn't see, they could, they couldn't see any acoustic signature. Oh, uh, okay. they're, they're thermoacoustically stable flames. Okay, great. 
Okay, the next question is from Yang Ging Li. Um, in the, is the combustion at low temperature chemistry generally linear, but um, at height T, will it become more and more nonlinear? I'm sorry, is the combustion at? Uh, is the combustion at low temperature chemistry generally linear, but at height T, will it become more and more nonlinear? Perhaps I'm misunderstanding the question. So um, if Yang Ling would like to jump in and ask it directly. Maybe by I'd linear, start... we mean the blow off curve. Um, the low temperature chemistry in general is not linear. Uh, so... no, okay. I guess we'll leave it, at, leave it at that question. Yeah, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, but uh, yeah. So that actually covers all the questions that have been sent through the chat from the audience. If there's anybody in the panel who still has a question, we, we have a few minutes left to go, or if not, if everybody could turn on their cameras for a moment and thank the speaker and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll close out the webinar here then.